So again, our topic for today is how to get practical about circularity. And I'm super excited that we have Stefan from McKinsey with us here today to tell us how he would get started on implementing the circular economy in consumer electronics. Now, Stefan is based in Zurich and he has been with the firm since 2012. He's an expert associate partner and co-lead of the circular, circularity service line. In his role, he's actually done many CE transformations with, with clients, particularly in consumer electronics, but also in other industries. And he has a background in electrical engineering, which of course helps him a lot with that. Additionally, he spearheads McKinsey circularity partnerships, for example, with the World Economic Forum on circular cars, which you might have already read about in the news. Now in the next roughly 30 minutes, Stefan will give you a perspective on the materials transition and why circularity is key for every company. Based on a client example from the consumer electronics industry, he will walk us through the steps of a circularity transformation. Furthermore, Stefan will also share some learnings and tools that McKinsey has developed to support companies along the journey. And after the presentation, there will be time for Q&A. And after roughly 60 minutes, we want to take also some time for you to network. So we have scheduled some breakouts that we can then jump in right, right afterwards. But now without further ado, I would like to hand over to Stefan. So you can already start sharing your slides. And again, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. Off you go, Stefan. Thank you, Sebastian. And yeah, thanks a lot for having me. I'm really excited to talk to so many of you. Uh, I think uh, this is a, yeah, a great topic, uh, a great passion of myself, um, and uh, really love the, the circularity community that you've built up here. Really impressive. And yeah, today's topic is about getting practical about circularity. Um, so I would love to share some of the learnings from the past years, uh, helping companies on their transition to a more circular economy. Um, and we yeah, have indeed a couple, uh, one example from the consumer electronics space that, that we're going to talk through in more details. Um, also about how to, you know, really measure circularity, how to derive kind of concrete levers and work streams, and then finally also how to, how to implement and drive really the change throughout the organizations. Um, before going a bit into content quickly, what is, you know, what is McKinsey, what is McKinsey doing in circularity? Probably everybody, everybody is aware of McKinsey as a, as a management consultancy. What is probably a bit less known is our circularity work. Um, but we've been actually very active on circularity since 10 plus years. We work together also with the Ellen McArthur Foundation uh, on some of the initial reports around the butterfly framework and have since ever then actually published numerous, um, you know, articles and publications. You can all access them online. And more recently, we also acquired Material Economics, which is a boutique consultancy focusing on the material transition as well as on circularity uh, to strengthen you know, further our knowledge. They've done some really remarkable work, uh, also together with the um, with with various other uh, think tanks, and also have been very heavily cited by the European Union in some of their recent reports on circularity. So, and what we help actually companies is is uh, very broadly in, in sustainability transitions. So the whole, um, you know, net zero. Um, discussions, but then now more recently, um, right, much more, especially on circularity and they're the, from the initial uh, strategy definition, diagnostic to, um, to driving, driving really impact. Um, so with this, what we have on the menu today are, are three, three agenda topics. First, I want to briefly talk about the material transition and why this is really driving circularity and accelerating our transition to circular economy. And secondly, um, talking about how do we identify the biggest opportunity er er areas for circularity with an example of a consumer electronic company. And then thirdly, how to actually set up and really approach a circular transformation. And I would love to make this interactive. So please, you know, ask questions in the chat um, or, you know, raise your hand, interrupt me. Um, Let's let's make this a dialogue, um, and and then also there's space at the end for Q and A, um, if you prefer to wait. Excellent. So let's then dive right into into the material transition. Um, and I think many of you are very familiar with circularity, so I'm not going to bore you too long with this. But I think there are some new nice facts that you probably can also use in your internal discussions around circularity. 
uh, that I hopefully can share with you. Um, so we looked at, at the carbon budget that we have available in order to um, reach our you know, 1.5 uh, degree carbon um, target um, over the next 100 years. And notice, right, we, we have around five to 800 billion tons of CO2 available um, globally. And out of this, typically, you know, in the past 20 to 25% of all CO2 emissions are from material production and incineration. So meaning, right, we, we roughly have out of, out of the five to 800 that we have left, only 100 to 200 uh, billion tons available for material related emissions. And if we now compare this on the right hand side to actually how much CO2 emissions we have from our material production, it's way up, way above, right? Even if we do, in the very best case on the right hand side, if we use the most energy efficient production methods and use carbon, you know, zero carbon energy production, we still won't meet, you know, this target. So it's very clear we need circularity if we really want to achieve our, you know, net zero targets and our 1.5 degree targets. There's, there's no way no way around circularity. And, and as we all know, right, circularity is not only about CO2, it's also much more about preserving resources. Um, but, but as we all know, right, CO2 is obviously a, a very hot topic these days. Um, and, and I think this, this potentially allows you to link the two a bit better. So the question now might come, so are we not circular yet, right? If you look at all the PET and stuff, and we clearly aren't, right? So we did an analysis here for Europe, where we looked at the, the three major materials, steel, plastic, and aluminum. And uh, unfortunately, only um, less than actually 40% of the material value that is being created is preserved. So meaning we have on the left-hand side a large portion of our uh, value that is lost through volume losses. So meaning that we don't recycle the materials um, end of life or don't reuse the, you know, the products and the components. And then another thing is that we also, uh, the material that we even recycle or reuse, it loses its, you know, its value in terms of quality and price losses. Um, and I think both, um, both things we, we can definitely address with, with circularity and hopefully make this a much better story going forward. Um, and there's actually you know, beyond the need that we saw to drive circularity, there's also a, a lot of drivers that really accelerate circularity. And uh, one that I would love to highlight now is, is uh, the policy and the regulation. There's now more recently been additional regulations coming into or being announced that will make, um, that will increase the, the momentum towards the circular economy. One of them is the carbon border adjustment mechanism by the EU. It's basically, puts uh, a carbon a CO2 tariff on imported materials. Um, and we did some analysis here for, for you know, for materials and, um, and looked into how much will this actually change the price of these materials going forward. And the impact is, is quite dramatic. So you see in these bubbles at the very bottom. So for example, for plastic, we expect the price of, you know, um, virgin, plastic being imported in the European Union going up by 25 to 50 percent until uh, until 2035 and similar right for the other uh, materials and this right shifts then this makes recycled material much more attractive and will 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 really enable you know and accelerate the circular economy uh, and I think it's also the first time that we actually really see in the European Union uh, commodity prices, you know, taking account of CO2, the CO2 emissions. This has not been there before, and it really will change, right, the, the playing rules for the companies and, and, and accelerate our circular economy. I think, um, and there's more to come, right? Regulation, as we all know, is, um, is further intensifying, and companies um, have ambitions targets out there and, and are, are adding new ones. So I think there's uh, a lot to be excited about uh, in terms of circularity. And this is in the client discussions that we have, this, this uh, is also being recognized by, by many of our clients. And here, uh, a nice quote that I like a lot from one of the uh, a large uh, cap um, producer here in, in Europe, which basically says, you know, recycle materials 
you know, we have plenty fell. We have so many, you know, products out there. Uh, the quality will improve over time with new technologies. At the same time, we all know, right, virgin material is, from an environmental perspective, problematic. And we had just saw in the previous chart, right, it will be disincentivized. So if we really want to be also a low-cost producer going forward in the, you know, a, um, 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 kind of a, a leading producer, we actually need to use recycled material, right? We need to embrace the circular economy. Um, and, you know, this, this really shows that, you know, this thinking of the circular economy now, um, you know, is, is embraced more and more by, by the business world. Um, the, the to interrupt. We actually yeah, sure. Go ahead. Already took a questions in the in the chat. The first one was on the price for commodities produced within the EU. Like, is it for within the EU or is it for import or both? I think it was two slides back. Yeah, exactly. So this is indeed for the um, the cost increase for the the material that are imported into the EU, right? So this is a tariff. So whenever you know steel or plastic is imported from from China, this. Uh, this tariff will be added um, and, and hence given right given this is um, a commodity market you probably also will have increasingly have pressure then on the, on the prices internally in the market itself um, to reflect better the, the CO2, CO2 emissions that are behind. Then the, the other question is, will be will be able to access the slides afterwards? Yeah, I think this is being recorded and you can um, Get access to the recording to my understanding right exactly yes thank you perfect but yeah please keep the questions coming yeah um looking then into right we saw now before there's more and more and more and more momentum towards recycled materials and we also see some first implications um in you know, in the raw mat in the recycled material prices today, I think recycled uh, PET, right, is already a higher price today than virgin PET, right? So there's a, a green premium, which is also driven by the commitments of many of the, you know, consumer companies to, to adopt uh, uh, recycled PET. We did an analysis to, for, you know, it's a, it's a model, right? It's a, it's a forecast across different materials uh, with an outlook for 2025 and 2030 uh, along key materials on what is the supply and demand um, outlook, you know, for, for these time periods. And for some materials like plastic and steel, we see there's a over demand, basically, so we won't have enough recycled or low carbon steel. Uh, and plastic and for other materials right now it looks more positive there, there should be enough um, enough uh, supply basically at the same time having said this this picture also changes quite frequently right so it depends a lot by how much new capacities are being announced um, and new investments that are being announced etc new commitments also coming in um, etc but overall right um, I think the what I want to say with this picture is um, circularity helps you to circumvent this discussion because if you right produce your own products and materials and you take back take them back at end of life, you have access to your own materials. You're much more resilient, much more independent of of these price outlooks. And embracing circularity now early on will uh, will also give you a strategic advantage uh, when the prices of recycled material increase and you are forced by regulation to adopt them at, at a later stage. So that's it a bit in terms of material transition. I, I hope there was enough motivation uh, to keep us all excited on, on, uh, on circularity. Um, any, any questions at this stage before I dive a bit into the, into the biggest opportunity areas? Yes, there is another one by Elgast. Have you come across any quality issues with recycled aluminum or steel for final products? Or is the challenge mostly related to the yet missing supply chains and quantity gap? Yeah, um, I think excellent question. So uh, for sure, right? I mean, there's um, there are these uh, quality considerations. I think steel and aluminum are both you know, materials that since ever actually used quite some share of recycled material already, right? It's um, 
uh, they you saw it also in one of the previous charts. They already um, is already in this quite established uh, recycling system. Uh, but for some uh, products, right, like also in the car, in, the, in you know, in, uh, in cars, you need really high strength, uh, high strength um, steels and aluminium. Um, and if you have sources that are a bit contaminated, it's difficult to achieve these quality levels. I think bare circularity can help to create more mono material streams of higher quality that allow to achieve the, the same quality level than uh, than, than virgin material. Um, so indeed, right? We we have these we have these challenges in, uh, many times, um, and but there's also a way basically a, a, around them. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Perfect. Then let's dive into the biggest opportunity areas um, for consumer electronics. And I think the first questions that we um, oftentimes face is how do you actually measure circularity, right? So to really make it practical, you need to know how to measure it, how to assess it, how can we improve it? And there are different KPIs out there. Um, and one that we uh, at McKinsey and Material Economics like to use a lot is virgin material per useful service as a key metric. The beautiful thing is it contains um, several different elements how circularity really creates impact um, for you know, a company and the broader society. And the, aim, the end goal is to reduce right, the amount of virgin material that you use, so shifting more to recycled material, and to maximize the useful service that a product can provide. And with useful service, we mean not lifetime, right? Not designing necessarily products that last forever, but actually only, uh, are not used forever, but really having an offering that is used for um, the longest time possible, right? So creating product that, that are basically being used. And <clears throat> this virtual material per useful service, as you can see on the slide, can be broken down into the three uh, pillars. Um, and each of them is basically a sub KPI that you can look at. And then if you multiply them together, you, you get this uh, the virtual material or useful service. So the first pillar is around uh, recycling um, and recirculation. So making sure that the product that you produce um, has a high, a high share of recycled content slash a very low share of virtual material in, in your product, in, your, in the material that you use. Then second, material efficiency is around how much material does your product contain. So they're right, trying to minimize the waste in your production, but also coming up with product designs that use uh, less material in, in the first place. And then lastly, and I think very exciting, is also the circle of business models. So here it's all about designing products that have um, that offer a lot of useful service uh, for a single product. So basically coming up with offerings, um, you know, that, that are more high with higher utilization, uh, higher lifetime and less, um, you know, less wasted production, basically for products that are not being used as we, for example, see often in the textile industry, but also to some extent in the consumer electronics space. And below you see a couple of examples how this can be applied. And the last one is probably a bit more relevant for you as in the consumer electronic space. So we applied this um, several times already in the consumer electronic space. Uh, once here for a vacuum cleaner. So for a vacuum cleaner, you would basically measure how much kilogram of virgin material um, um, are being consumed per use cycle. And the use cycle means um, a quantity of time, right? So it can be um, uh, how many years actually a customer typically uses a, a vacuum cleaner, or it can also mean um, how many, uh, you know, a one use cycle is kind of 30 minutes of vacuum cleaning your floor, right? Uh, both both version work. And um, you basically want to minimize this, this amount. And, and you see it works across different industries. We've, we've applied this for also for servers and uh, laptops, um, we also applied it for textile. Uh, it's really a metric that goes for many kind of industrial and consumer products. If we then go a bit one step further, right? So what's behind and how can we make this actionable, this metric? 
um, behind each of the, the three pillars, there are different levers that you can apply in order to, um, in order to become more uh, circular. In the first pillar under material recirculation, it's all around recycling materials, either right through um, closed loop recycling, so taking back your own products, recycling them, or also sourcing recycled content from other applications. Um, then there's the, the whole remanufacturing notion, so reusing of components in your own production, um, or you know using them as spare parts, etc. And then thirdly, optimizing the design of your product for recirculation, or potentially taking back products and then selling the recyclers also to other to other companies to make sure that the material is, you know, being reused and, and not being incinerated or uh, landfilled. You know? Then the middle column, material efficiency. There's a big story around waste. So reducing waste and valorizing waste in your production. With valorizing waste, we mean the waste that we, um, I mean, you, you always have some amount of waste, right? Creating production of, also in the consumer electronic space, it's really hard to avoid uh, all waste. So the waste that, that remains rather than, again, incinerating it, um, or um, why not bringing it back to your supplier um, or otherwise, you know, selling it on, on a, on a, in the, in the third, to a third party that really would appreciate such waste is, is something many companies don't do yet. And there's also some, quite some financial potential behind. And then on number five here, optimizing design and specifications of your product. So really thinking about, um, can we design the product in such a way that it uses less virgin material? That it's maybe uh, less, you know, less weight, or can we just also rethink the whole value proposition? I always like the car example, right? Does a car necessarily need to have five seats, right? Uh, even though we all know the average car drives around with one and a half person in it, do we come up with a car design that that has only two seats, for example, right? Um, and then on the circular business model side, the three, the three subcategories here is uh, increasing utilization, um, extending product lifetime, and reducing overproduction. So on the utilization, you have all these sharing, leasing, reusing concepts um, that at the end, right, increase utilization. On the product lifetime, it's about repairing products, refurbishment, refurbishing them, or designing the product in a way that they're more durable, or offering care offering, right, that your customers take better care of your um, you know, vacuum cleaner so that it lasts longer. And um, lastly, overproduction. This is also something we see in the consumer electronics space, right? The products being produced to stock uh, and not all products are being sold. And then some you know, basically um, are, are not utilized as, as much as they could be at the end of the day or go to waste. So this is a bit the framework, and we've um, also built the tool, we call it loop tool, that basically assesses all these levers. And I'm going to show you now an example for a vacuum cleaner um, that we, where we applied the tool. And um, you will, we'll show on the next slide what's a bit the outcome and which levers are most, um, are most attractive based on this analysis. Um, obviously, the analysis depends heavily on the baseline, on the assumptions behind. Um, and, and the result might differ, right, in your case. Um, so please keep this in mind, right? It's not that this is kind of the general and only truth what to do with a vacuum cleaner. Uh, but in this specific example, um, is these are the results that we, that we came up with. Yeah. So we look here at, uh, you know, kind of a typical average vacuum cleaner out there, sales price of, you know, around 200 US dollars. The lifetime from a product design would have been designed for 15 years. But actually, if we look and ask our customers how long is it typically used, it's you know on average more around seven years. So you know customers, you know the vacuum cleaner gets scratched, um, or maybe they see you know a, a newer version of a, a newer model out there and and buy a new one, even though the old one would still you know work uh, from a technical perspective. We also then in the model look into the different uh, materials that are in a vacuum cleaner. And these are the most important ones, right? So it's a lot of plastic, PP, ABS, PVC, and a bit of steel. And in this example, it's a vacuum cleaner that, that comes with 
100% virgin material, which is um, still the case, unfortunately, for, for many of the consumer electronic products out there, that the large majority is, is virgin material. And you also see in the graph, right, we, uh, we then analyzed um, also the scrap um, that you have in the production of the, of the vacuum cleaner. In this case, it was 15%. So these, this is basically waste that is, for example, happening in the plastic molding, right, where you lose some of the, the PP um, polymers that you buy, uh, but also it can be in the steel, right, for stamping out steel. There's some waste that basically some material that you buy that don't, doesn't make it into the end product. So with this baseline in mind, we then right analyze the, the, the eight categories that you saw before and um, um, basically look, assess for each of them, what's the merchant material uh, per useful service and what is also the cost um, required for such a lever. And uh, we show, we typically like to show this on a circularity cost curve um, and it's similar to a carbon abatement cost curve. Many of you are probably aware of such a the carbon abatement cost curve. The way you read it is <clears throat> you have on the y-axis here, you have the, the cost per virgin material avoided uh, per, per kilogram, right? So how much does it cost to avoid one kilogram of virgin material? Um, similar to how much will it cost to avoid one you know, kilogram of CO2. And on the other axis, you have the how much virgin material is actually being avoided through this measure. And so you wanna, you know, the more attractive levers are the ones that are below the x axis. So here on the top, you know, um, most on the on the most left side, and the ones that have the biggest kind of surface, because the bigger the surface, the more virgin material you actually can take out. So this is modeled on the full portfolio. So it assumes, you know, we, we sell, I don't know, 10,000 vacuum cleaners. And on these 10,000 vacuum cleaners, how much virgin material can we basically avoid? And what you can see now in terms of picture is, um, <clears throat> right, the material efficiency and material recirculation levers, they're more in the middle of the, of the framework, meaning that they are from a financial perspective, Right, overall rather attractive um, and, and can also reduce significantly the, the virtual material required. Uh, however, this, um, and then if you look at the circular business model levers, there we have a bit two camps, right? We have some circular business model levers that are financially uh, very attractive, whereas others are not really attractive in, in a standalone fashion, right? Doesn't mean we shouldn't do them, but standalone. Uh, they are they are less attractive with these particular assumptions that we have uh, behind the model. Um, but overall, right, looking at the big picture, many levers are have actually a positive business case, so it's quite encouraging. You can, right, you could become more circular and at the same time uh, reduce your cost or basically increase your sales. Um, um, you know, uh, yeah, making more profit actually with, with circular business models. So let's look into some of the, the details, right? So some of the highlights. So if you look at what's the, this particular model, what's the most attractive lever for vacuum cleaner? It's, um, it's leasing um, for, the, for the reason that it really increases the utilization of a vacuum cleaner. So you have, um, right, when a person after, um, you know, five, six, seven years returns back the vacuum cleaner because he or she maybe wants a, a different model for, for the purposes that, you know, that the person needs. Um, you can then um, basically give this vacuum cleaner to somebody else, lease it out again, and hence achieve a higher utilization. And oftentimes these, these leasing arrangements also allow you to, um, to ask for premium for higher price than what you would, you know, than the 200 euros that you saw before. If you do this in a monthly subscription, uh, there's some um, higher, in, them, in, the, in that sense, willingness to pay for, for such an offering. Um, then another one, 7B here, refurbishment, a little bit less attractive um, than leasing, um, because especially, right, refurbishment is a bit of more of a, might require some additional cost to actually do the operations. Uh, but nonetheless, um, 
we also see for vacuum cleaners, right? Many products that actually can be taken back are still in a very good state, uh, require some, you know, changing of the housing and can be reused and actually resold at a, you know, 10, 20% lower price than a, than, a, than a new product. So this makes it also quite, uh, quite an attractive lever. And then as, as mentioned, right, the whole recycling uh, and material efficiency, definitely something to look into on the, the whole use of recycling, right? There it depends a lot on which materials and how you do it, right? So for vacuum cleaner, and happy to go a bit into more details later on. Um, so it depends a lot where you get the recyclates from, right? So what we see out there, the market prices for some of the plastics are have, have already a significant price premium uh, on it. If you ask, if you just want to buy it on the open market, but if you find, you know, a partnership arrangement with a supplier um, where you supply your own products end of life and then recycle them, through mechanical recycling, for example, you can achieve um, you can achieve more attractive attractive deals. Yeah. And then on the right hand side, on these circle of business models that are a bit less attractive, there we have in this graph here more the repair um, durability, so designing the product that it lasts for longer and care. The reason why they show up as a bit less attractive here is that the assumption in the model is that for repair for example, we would make the repair cheaper than it is today, right? So the issue with repair today is this, it costs a lot, right? Spare parts are expensive. Many of you know the vacuum cleaner companies out there, they ask for a premium on spare parts. And, um, and, and hence customers decide not to repair an equipment, even though right, it could be repaired. So we assumed in this model, you would make repairs more affordable, hence reducing the margin of the repair. Hence, right, this, it's less profitable, but at the same time, um, the same time reduces virgin material. And similar a bit for, for care and durability, it extends um, the lifetime. Uh, and there's also some cannibalization that you need to take into account, right? If you if you um, if a product is then being repaired, right, or, or designed for longer, uh, there's obviously one product being sold than less, right, over time. Um, so this is kind of what came out, came, comes out in the model. Yeah. I see we have now a couple of questions as well in the chat. So yes, look I didn't at want yeah. to interrupt you during your present, presenting the <laughs> slides. And I think you have already answered a couple of questions on the go. Um, so there was one question around repair and uh, why it is uh, so high in cost. But I think you covered that, unless you have anything to add to that. And then also on the other assumptions um, of, for example, 7A, 7C, 7D. Yeah, exactly. So on, yeah, indeed on the repair, <clears throat> as mentioned, right? It's just the assumption that, I mean, repair is right per se a very, for many, you know, uh, consumer electronics and appliance manufacturer and a very attractive lever, right? And you obviously should offer repair uh, from a, an environmental perspective. It would obviously be interesting to make the repair as, as affordable as possible for customers, meaning there's less money to be made. And, and, and this assumption here just assumes that, you know, you reduce the margin on your repair, you make it cheaper, and hence, uh, as a company, you would, you would make less money on the repair. Um, but, but yeah, you can obviously model it differently that it shows, uh, that just shows them the profitability of a repair as it is today, and then it would, repair would be a, a quite attractive lever. And then 7C and D, um, yeah, on, on C and D, right, with durability and care, as, as mentioned, the durability, we just assume in this model here, the cannibalization. I mean, for all levers, we have actually assume cannibalization where it applies. So meaning if a product is being used for longer, you, you know, you sell a little bit less uh, of a new product. Mm -hmm. Hence, there's a trade-off, right? Um, and, and in this model durability, it's basically, you know, it costs you money to make the product uh, last longer and uh, making it last longer you then sell fewer new products so it, it reduces the virgin material um, but on its own it's unfortunately not um, you know financially very attractive what we recommend though is to combine these levers 7a c and d together with other levers such as you know subscriptions leasing um, refurbishment etc to have a more integrated offering. And then you can basically allow to have, you basically wanna have, you know, a product that is more durable, 
if you lease it out and 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 the two then offset each other <clears throat> i hope this answers the question and then slide 13 why is repair so high i think you touched on this yes there was another one if you accounted for reverse logistics costs for leasing and refurbishing if i count for for reverse logistics costs for leasing and refurbishing yes this has been uh accounted in this model um indeed yeah mm -hmm. then i think there the 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 what the learning for from you know for vacuum cleaners but also more generally is um for for more bulkier equipment you want to have this local right so a regional approach to take back your uh your products otherwise right the transport costs might be prohibitive i think it's a bit less the case for smartphones and smaller uh, consumer electronic devices but for larger ones like appliances it's, it's definitely more of a regional approach to keep these costs in into balance and indeed it's one of the challenges that we oftentimes see in in circular business models that the logistics cost um, can be tricky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then maybe more of an overall question. So, I mean, since this is uh, pretty much cost-based, um, what other frameworks or metrics uh, would you recommend or do actually companies use to best prioritize resource allocation into the different strategies? So yeah, uh, excellent question. Good. So I think we we are a big fan of this um, virgin material per useful service metrics, um, given I think it focuses on, you know, the area that are most important um, today for many companies. Another metric, which I personally also like a lot, is the, the, the circularity score that the circular gap report is also using, where you may mention where you measure how much of the material is kept into uh circulation which puts a bit more emphasis also on um you know the recirculation at the end of life um and in this in this model here right um it's indirectly included given under material recirculation we also have for example closed loop, loop recycling which then also assumes that you keep the material yourself in the loop and don't necessarily rely on on third parties to do that um yeah mm -hmm. Hope this answers the question. Yes. Again, to everybody, uh, since there are many questions coming in, you can, of course, also raise your hand and unmute yourself. And I saw that Ralf has just raised your hand. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question directly? Yes, Hi, I'm Ralf. Um, um, I'm, I'm not sure, or, or for me, it's unclear how you assume the number for utilization and what is exactly how, how you define it exactly. So mm -hmm. for me, utilization means if I if I uh, buy together with my four neighbors a vacuum cleaner and use it together, we have a high utilization. But if I lease a, uh, I'm leasing a car or a vacuum cleaner and I put it in the corner and do nothing with it, there's zero utilization. So this is somehow yeah uh, not clear for me. Excellent question. Your example here. Excellent question, Ralph. So for indeed we we use um, we look at the utilization of the full. Um, lifetime right and both aspects are are equally important right so on one side that several people um you know for example share something right then you have like a, a higher utilization uh, over the the time period but you also want to make sure that the lifetime of the product is um is utilized as much as possible and therefore the vacuum cleaner example we see today as as, as you saw in the baseline right um this lifetime utilization being quite low, meaning that the product, right, it has been designed to last for, for, for longer. Um, but however, it's only used now in this case, I don't know, 50% of the time. But I'm fully with you. Ideally, we then have a, a sharing model for vacuum cleaner, and it's probably a bit tricky, right? And that's why we also have not included it yet in our analysis. But ideally, you would then obviously share the vacuum cleaner during this time period as, as much as possible as well. And the lifetime utilization, how we measure it actually is in terms of um, in time. So it, at the end of the day, it means how much, um, how many hours is a product really being used? So if you share then the equipment between different people, right, this this hourly, utility, you know, the number of hours is also going up then, right? So you really make sure that the product is, you know, used to the extent it has been designed for. Okay. Does it answer the question? yeah more or less yes but then for the utilization of a vacuum cleaner i would say it's 10 minutes a day exactly yeah so that's yeah, that, but not 50 percent 
<laughs> yes. Uh, however, right, this lifetime, that's how it's calculated for vacuum cleaner is uh, the 15 years, are, I think like something around 2000 hours or so. Um, and these hours, right, you can either use them up in a year, right? So if you clean every day, the full day, 24 hours, you know, the two hours, are, 2000 hours are used up super quickly. Or you can indeed just clean 10 minutes every day or 30 minutes a week is kind of the average that a vacuum cleaner is being used to my understanding. Um, and then you, you know, the equipment would last 15 years, but it's the same. It's basically the time for which an equipment is being designed, right? From a technical perspective, you want to make sure this, this time is used as effective as possible. Okay. Understand, but yeah, I understand. But there is some information missing so it was more clear. Great. Well, I agree, right? It's a, it's a tricky concept. Um, and and um, yeah. So yeah. Then, then we have another question uh, posed by Santiago. Santiago, do you want to unmute yourself? And I forgot to say that, uh, Barat, but please also mention uh, where you're from, like your company or your employer you're working for. Hi, so this is Santiago from Circle Lata. Um, we are a consultant and NGO in all of Latin America for Circle Economy. And I wanted to ask um, which area in Germany you're doing these assumptions as there may be a bit of cost variations also within Germany. And um, if there's more detailed data um, on the assumptions that you made um, on the profitability of each case. Yeah, so indeed, we uh, this is a European example here, uh, not uh, not a, um, a German example. Um, we but are, are we in Monaco or are we in Bulgaria? <laughs> it's um, it's um, more like Western Europe, right? Like in that sense, kind of you know, France, UK, Germany, these types of markets that are the assumptions behind here. Yeah. But I agree, right? Like in terms of labor cost and um, especially then for the refurbishment, et cetera, this obviously depends heavily on, on the labor cost assumptions that are behind there. Yeah. Perfect. And then there are two more questions from Jan. I don't know, Jan, if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question directly. If not, then I can also take over. Uh, one question is, uh, have you also looked at the environmental impacts of the financially viable options, for example, leasing, because it's not a given that a longer lifetime leads to a lower impact? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so indeed, right, like, so you, I guess you refer to the, the fact that some equipment then, right, you know, the scope-free downstream energy uh, consumption topic, right? Um, I think in, indeed the model, this loop model here also looks into the CO2 impact um, and basically is able to, to generate a similar graph on, on a CO2 basis. And I'll, I'll have a chart on this actually in, in one or two slides. Yes, um, hello. Sorry, I, I was just on I was just on the road, but but can you hear me? Yes. I can elaborate. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, by the way, thanks and great work. Uh, really, really interesting to, um, to follow. Um, yeah, because there's a cutoff point, right? Um, because it uses, it uses energy in the use phase and then uh, maybe more superior product with new technology has a much lower energy usage. And then there's, you know, so that, that's why I'm asking. I was just wondering because one of the whole points is to uh, improve the environmental performance, right? Of the circular economy. And then yeah, I feel it's important to recognize that, you know, with a, if I, and I think a vacuum cleaner is a really good example because it's quite energy intensive in the use phase. They can of course make assumptions about where that energy is coming from yeah. um, and that might improve over time with more renewable energy in the grid and so on but yeah, yeah. Just with current current grid mix it's it's like you know maybe after seven years it's actually good to dispose of it and get a new one because of technology improvements i, I was just wondering yeah. if that was part of your model yeah i know in, indeed so yeah an excellent question right now indeed it's a discussion uh, we we have a lot right with our with our clients and the indeed it's part of the model right we, we look into the co2 and what's the co2 impact fortunately many of the levers right um have you know can reduce virtual material and co2 at the same time right the more virtual material you take out typically the, the also the less co2 you have um for the kind of the leasing levers there you then indeed can then have a discussion right do you also refurbish um the products over time right you basically up you know, potentially upgrade them to a more efficient um, 
product. So I um, have right now also a project ongoing with um, with a company that is producing motors, um, electrical motors. There you have a very similar discussion and electrical motors also become more and more efficient over time. Um, and 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 there we actually it makes sense after right especially if you have older less efficient motors to take back after after before the end of the lifetime the motor upgrade it to a more efficient motor right and then uh and then it's a win-win right in both sense um so indeed right it's a kind of a trade-off and you need to look into this um it's great that you captured that yeah, yeah thanks a lot uh and then, yeah, the second point, it was, so this is more the sustainability question, right? And then there was also that desirability, right? Like customer uptake. I was also wondering, obviously it's like a wish list for a model, you know, obviously you have constraints and, and limitations here and, and that's that's completely fine. I was just wondering, you know, who wants to lease a vacuum? Yeah. Right? Did you did you yes. take that into account, like desirability of, of these options? Yeah, exactly. So we took this into account. We, so we, we assume a portfolio uh, of vacuum cleaners uh, that you have, like, um, and, Typically on the leasing, right, we see there's not more than 10 to 20% of, of the um, of the customer actually really interested in into leasing and in going into leasing. Um, and, and hence this limits then the overall potential of how much virtual material you can basically reduce uh, through such a leasing approach. Um, uh, okay, so so the what's here, the financially viable options then would be sort of a 10%. Or twenty percent of the portfolio that you could servitize. Exactly. Exactly. Ah, okay, got it. Okay, thank you. Stefan, you have to yeah. tell us uh, where yeah. we have to move on, but there are many questions, and I think since there is interest, yeah, yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. For a bit. Um, there was another question by Marcel Seger. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah, want to great. post the question live? Sure. I just unmuted myself, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'd be interested in knowing, have you applied the model to other types of consumer electronic products, specifically to those who inherently carry more valuable resources, um, smartphones, et cetera, yeah. but also, yes. especially down the road with the future trend that we are seeing, um, CPUs being implemented in more devices themselves, smart technologies. Yeah, yeah, excellent question. Yeah, indeed, we've applied it also for uh, for servers at the moment, right? Um, and we are currently um, also rolling it out for smartphones. And there, um, where well, the picture then looks looks a bit different, um, you have. Um, let me think through for um, on the server side. Right, it's a very particular industry where um, you know you always want to have the latest hardware, especially the big hyperscalers. Right, they always need the latest generation, the most energy efficient. It's, it's Jan a bit to your point before. Their energy efficiency is obviously hugely important, um, and 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 hence the considerations are a bit different. Right, so you um, you you have a hard time than to a harder time for servers, for example, to sell than a um you know a five-year-old server even though it would still work fine um to to a second-hand user right um so there's there's particular considerations in each of them and we yeah so that's a bit where we are and and there's also cindy i think on the call she's leading our loop development uh and loop tool um so let us know right happy to have also you know a private discussion with you if you're interested in, in applying the loop tool for your particular product <clears throat> Perfect. And then we have another question by Michelle. And please Thank you. Uh, don't forget to mention the company you're working for or where you're yes. from. Thank you. Um, my name is Michelle and I'm uh, working at, I'm a senior consultant at Nordic Sustainability and I'm calling in from Copenhagen. And uh, thanks to everyone uh, for this very interesting presentation and Stefan for this uh, very insightful presentation. And I just wanted to ask about the um, the leasing um, estimation, and I was wondering if there's if you found some way or methodology to account for potential lifespan limitations um, when considering leasing. Because my understanding is that sometimes leasing does limit a uh, product lifespan. For example, seen in uh, the rise of leasing of last mile transportation or these sharing solutions, where customers might only be able to tolerate. Um, products that are much newer than they might tolerate, for example, if they have a vacuum cleaner that they have had um, in their home for 10 years or so. So I was wondering if there's any way that you've um, managed to integrate that into your assumptions. 
Yeah, so indeed we, we've integrated some assumptions on the lifetime. What's the lifetime impact and what is the, the utilization impact, uh, right? So along, along our framework, every lever basically has assumptions, um, you know, on, on these different KPIs, how, how is this being impacted? Um, and I, I'm with you, Michelle, right? Like indeed leasing uh, will definitely negatively impact the, the lifetime, right? So it depends on, you know, the product overall, but yeah, there's a tendency that it could use the lifetime given the transportation. At the same time, it increases the utilization, right? You have less this issue, the products are being, um, you know, thrown away, even though they would still have lifetime in, in itself, you know? That's true, yes, it's a difficult question. Yes. Yeah, and I think to 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 also uh, respond to that, right? I think Stefan, there's also been some cases, and and Michelle, where we then say, okay, but maybe that means that we need to conduct, for example, more repairs, right? Or the repairs need to have additional components compared to some of the other levers that we look at to ensure that the quality is what you expect in in, in offering such a model, right? Yeah. Perfect. I think we're already in the middle of the discussion, which is the whole purpose of this session. So love it. Keep the questions going. I'll, I'll just also, in the interest of time, I want to briefly show um, the last section because I think it's also important. How do you make this now applicable, right? This is more a bit the, you know, prioritizing where are the biggest areas for your product. But then the question is, how do you now move to action? And um, I'm just going to skip a few slides. Um, but I um, want to briefly talk about how to approach it and then. Let's come, go back to our uh, Q&A discussion. So how do you now go about right, such a circularity transformation? Um, we think about the following four steps. Uh, we typically go up about, about these four steps. We, it all starts with uh, the market view and, and framing circularity more broadly for your company. Um, right, circle economy is a new concept or newer concept, right? Many, many people in companies are not fully aware yet um, of, of the implications. So it's very important very early on to create excitement, right, in the company of what's possible, share best practices, um, what others are doing, um, but also, you know, look in your market, what, what, what is happening, right, um, in, in your market, what are your peers and competitors doing, what are other players along your value chain are doing. And then define what really means circularity for your com company specifically. Um, where are the, you know, what's the terminology you want to use um, based on all the, the frameworks and concepts that are out there. Then number two is to define the, the strategy. Uh, so this is all along uh, what we just discussed before, right? Looking where's the biggest potential behind which levers, um, but then also um, coming up with a positioning, right? So meaning should do we want to now go after do we want to now set up uh, a refurbishment um uh, or do we want to rather go um towards a reuse uh, system or both etc do we um for example repair right do we want to offer our repairs for free going forward because we believe this is the right thing to do for society or do we keep continuing with our current service model kind of these strategic discussions they always have pros and cons and uh, need to be weighed out and um, the outcome of this strategy and positioning phase is to then set up um, different work streams that tackle specific, you know, opportunities that have been identified. And this A to F that you see on the slide are um, uh, the typical work streams that we see a lot coming up, and they cover actually most of most of the opportunity areas that we that we saw on the in the analysis. Now, I'll go into, into a bit more detail in a second, but then the idea in each work stream is to really, de, you know, set up a team um, that then details out the concept, right? If you say, for example, increasing the recycled content of your our existing products. So for which material does it most makes most sense? How can we set up partnership agreements with our suppliers, etc.? cetera? Um, and, you know, define the concept, calculate the business case, define an implementation roadmap, uh, that's basically the work that, that would need to happen here. And then afterwards, number four, it's all about the implementation. And here, very important is um, also to make sure you invest enough into the change management. This is right. Circularity has fundamental um, implications to many aspects of a company. It touches all, you know, all functions. 
and really important that to take the people with you uh, to train them and to excite them on the progress um, so that's a bit of uh, the big overview and then what are these work streams um, here that we typically see it's the following six some of them are more uh, cost focused whereas others are more revenue focused all of them are reducing virgin material and typically we see their you know, in such a transformation, the potential to reduce virgin material and, and CO2 oftentimes by 20 to 40 percent and grow, you know, revenue by 10 to 20 percent while reducing cost. And on the cost side, right, let me start on the left hand side, there's a lot around re recycled material sourcing, where typically the procurement organization is in the lead, but works very closely together with R&D. Uh, and, and you, right, go through your material spend and, and really analyze where do we have opportunities to you know switch to recycled materials at favorable terms how we can we have offtake agreements etc then circle operations um that's you know the factories here in the focus so looking at at the waste that is being generated what happens to can we further minimize it can we sell the waste that we still have uh, so these types of discussion um then number c circular product design it's a bit between cost and revenue um the idea is here to to look at your existing products and think how can I design them in a way that it's you know that they are more environmentally friendly so use less virgin material uh, cheaper uh, and at the same time also ideally cost less we call this our, our dual mission approach so reducing cost as well as becoming more sustainability at the same more sustainable at the same time the number D circular business models <clears throat> there, right, for your existing offering, investigate what can you set up an online marketplace to sell, you know, reused equipment? Can you sell your product offerings as a service? All, all these elements. And then number E on repair, care, and refurbish. I think this, the whole service function also gains a lot of more importance going forward. Um, especially can we, for example, shift more from just repair offerings uh towards care packages so avoiding that the, the product fails in in, a, in the first step and and also the whole refurbishment um topic is super important to um aspect yeah and then overall number f at the very bottom here uh we call this circular business building or developing a fully circular offering so this is um really taking it all together and, and rethinking completely your business model um so you might have seen Dell, they announced this, this Luna concept, right? A, a fully, um, yeah, we can argue if it's fully, but a quite circular uh, laptop, right? That can be easily disassembled. Um, you know, imagine this would come with a subscription. Um, it, it would be made out of, you know, fully recycled material in the production that is, you know, no waste. So really combining all these levers together into a distinctive offering um i think that's that's i think the beauty of it right to to combine all of this so, so i'll pause here happy to go into deeper in each of these dimensions with more material behind but also being cautious of time and there's a lot of questions in the chat so and feel free to just raise your hand and and ask questions uh, as well um, yes there is another one from michelle do you want to unmute yourself again Yes, uh, sure. I just was um, curious about if you have any um, product examples that I understand you would do a business model analysis, but then do you actually work on implementation of um, any of these types of projects as well? Um, yeah, we, for sure, we help set up, um, so typically the role of McKinsey is indeed help set up the whole transformation, defining the concepts. And then we, we, for us, it's always super important to build up the capabilities in the organization that the company then can carry out, um, um, you know, the, the actual day-to-day -day operational work on its own. So these capabilities are really there. Um, so we then often, right, we then oftentimes check in with the companies regularly to, to check the progress, to help where needed, to make sure that the, the impact is also delivered. And we uh, we also typically set up a, a tracking tool where we actually also measure right how much more how much are we reducing the virtual material that we buy how much uh, additional um, you know profit do we do we achieve for these circular business models? 
Great. Um, yeah, thank you for that response. And have you already seen um, quite a renewed interest in these services now with um, the new push in terms of EU policy? Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, circularity, I think it's, I mean, as you all know, right, there's a really increasing moment in the last, uh, you know, two, two years or so. Um, and, and right, new regulations are being, you know, regularly announced. And I think it's, yeah, it's just, yeah, indeed, there's an indeed increasing appetite for circularity. Thank you, <laughs> Stefan. Hi, Santiago. Hi, uh, yes. Um, so, Santiago again, I do not only work at Circle Latam, I also work for UBS, Swiss Bank, and I wanted to ask if you have um, experienced an effect of this um, circular models also on the valuations of companies. So, um, does this have a positive effect on the valuations of companies, regardless of the revenue effect, of course, does it have an additional um, effect yes. um, when going with the client? Yeah, I think that's a hotly debated topic, right? Um, in the not just for circularity, but for say, sustainability overall. Um, so I think overall we see a correlation between uh, companies that are more sustainable, have higher ESG ratings uh, with higher valuations of companies. Um, but now the question is, is, you know, it's only a correlation, doesn't mean it's a causation. Um, could also be the companies, right, that are, that make more money, uh, are more profitable, uh, also have more right time and resources to allocate into sustainability. Um, yeah, so that that's kind of a hotly debated topic, but but overall, indeed, we we see a correlation that uh, companies that embrace sustainability um, are uh, more you know have higher valuations and have uh, um, you know a better position. Additional question to correlations. Um... Um, what would be the highest correlation when you look into um, geographically countries that have a very developed circular economy um, business model or companies that drive it? Um, would it be more of uh, the political um, perspective and the political um, use or would it be education? Would it be capital? Are there any correlations that you have experienced? Would you say, okay, uh, for example, the Netherlands is a very advanced circular economy country because of mm -hmm. um, compared to other countries. Are there any correlations that you could share? Yeah, great question. I, I'm not really deep into this, unfortunately. Um, be happy to check, right, Santiago, and to come back to you. Maybe you can drop me an email and show with material economics. We looked into a lot into actually circular economies for typical countries. We also released a report recently on some of the Nordic countries. Um, um, yeah, so happy to look into this. Sure, will do. <laughs> We have some other questions in the chat. Um, yes, there is another one from Toby, number two. So we often see that circular business models do not scale because of low revenue potential, revenue gap, high operational complexity, and so on and so forth. How to overcome this? Yes, um, that's an ex excellent question. Um, I think it's... <clears throat> Right, I think there's obviously not one 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 answer that fits it all. Right, so uh, it's indeed important to from the beginning to prioritize the areas. Um, right, similar as we, as we saw today for the vacuum cleaner, where right there's the there's the most potential, um, and to go after these ones, and then um, right invest build. We always apply here also our. We call you know our um, very agile iterative approach of coming up with the concept, building an MVP quickly, test if it can work and what needs to be right, what needs to be in place in order to scale it, um, and and basically then learn you know learn from your experience and 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 improve upon this. Um, there's circularity right, especially the the whole take back logistics and disassembly heavily benefits also from scale right this is typically a challenge we see then when you start with it um how do you set it up when you don't have the scale yet um or you need to overcome some you know first periods of, of lower profitability until you then get to a model that is easier scalable and the more you get it up and running the better it works so for example one example there's also public this is uh, the mattress company Oping in the Netherlands. 
So they built the, the world's fully, fully first circular mattress and they recognized, you know, the, the fully circular mattress only works if I redesign the product. Um, I need to change also the product to make the circular business model work, right? So they designed the mattress that is only made out of two materials. Um, so it's kind of the, the steel spring and it's some, um, some, some natural polyester that, that they put in there. And, you know, this design of the mattress allowed them to come up with um, a disassembly process and uh, recycling refurbishment process that is much, much cheaper and makes the, the whole business model viable. So sometimes the answer is also to rethink the offering more holistically rather than just saying, hey, we now need to take back and disassemble somehow the, the product. Yeah. Can I jump in there for a moment? Because I've I, I've asked this question and um, I worked in the mattress business before, and of course the Alpine case is quite familiar. Um, they have rather low revenues, right? Uh, they have around seventy millions in revenues, and their mattresses are priced at a ha rather high price point, around one thousand mm -hmm. euros for a mattress. And then you have other competitors that maybe offer a mattress for three hundred euros. And yeah, if if you have a mattress that is um, out of these materials, um, like with these Alpic materials, with these PET mm -hmm. and uh, steel, um, for example, for um, the logistics, it's just super expensive because you cannot compress this mattress. So mm -hmm. it is really uh, difficult to to um, implement, um, um, yeah, a working and viable um, circular business model in the uh, mattress business. And I've already uh, always used this Alping example, but of course, uh, it was always seen, uh, this is something rather niche and not something for the mass market. And full disclosure, I was working for Emma, the sleep company. Hmm. And uh, of course, nice. <laughs> they're a bit more price sensitive. Yeah. Um, just just adding this, not a question, but just adding this. No, fantastic, Toby. And I, I uh, write like the... So what I hear from the OPING and what you read publicly there, right? They're it's they're scaling it up quite he heavily, right? They added now new product product lines, new additional circular product lines. Yeah, yeah. I you know, and they build, you know, started have now this this whole factory in place for the whole taking apart. You can now argue, right? We're not probably you're not yet yet there. It's like the mass market, but there's a big enough niche that is fast growing, right? And more and more consumers saying, here, I want to have a circular mattress. Um, yeah, but I, I agree with your concerns, right? As always, you can always look at it from two sides. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Stefan, the questions keep coming in, but to be cautious of time, sure. I would say let's wrap things up so that we give everybody a bit of time for networking. Yes. And what we would actually do um, is also to have one breakout with you for a Q&A, but Paula will moderate that uh, in another second. So... Any last concluding words from your side? No, thanks a lot for having me. Um, feel free to reach out to me. You see my email here, stefanfani at mckinsey.com. Happy to have you know individual follow-ups um, and happy to show you also the loop to, uh, tool in more detail together with Cindy. It was a pleasure talking to all of you and uh, keep the good work going. Yeah.